Hi again. Welcome back to another video. This is, I believe, video number eight. Um, and this is still talking about how did we bend the laws of ecology. This is the second time that we did. So the first time was the agricultural revolution. We talked about the consequences um, involved in that, that we raised our, uh, we found out by being able to farm, we could actually raise our carrying capacity. This time it is the scientific revolution in 1500 AD. Um, and this is going to be the, the way we're going to bend the laws of ecology this time is by basically turning the entire planet into one ecosystem. So what we're going to do is again structure it the same way. We've got when, why, results, and consequences. I'm going to try to get through all of these in one video if I can. Um, so to, uh, to begin with when, the scientific revolution, why? is basically because um, we discovered, and really it's Christopher Columbus who kind of does this, we discovered we were ignorant. Christopher Columbus um, gets a bad rap nowadays, and I think justifiably so. I mean, he was sort of horrible to the people who he found when he uh, arrived in the Caribbean. Um, Christopher Columbus was obviously trying to get to East Asia. He didn't get there. He found North and South America. Now, here is where um, I'm going to take the story in a slightly different direction. Usually what we do then is we say, well, this is good because it discovered the new world, or this is bad because it led to genocide. Um, you come down on that's wherever you want to come down on it. What I want to focus on is the fact that in 1500, 1492, when he goes there, it's really important to understand that everybody in Europe at that time sort of figured that they knew everything. I mean, they may as an individual not know everything, but they thought everything that was to be known was known. You basically had two sources of knowledge, the Bible and Aristotle. And because both of those things were sort of known um, by at least some people, the main um, idea in the Middle Ages was, well, we know everything. Then imagine the surprise when Christopher Columbus reports back, oh yeah, we thought we knew everything, but it turns out there are two continents that we didn't know about. And there are a whole bunch of people there and animals there and plants there that nobody's ever heard of before. This was really um, an amazing, like, earth-shattering. I mean, imagine what you would do if, a, like, all of a sudden somebody reported back and said, oh, yeah, it turns out in the Pacific uh, Ocean there's a whole other continent with animals and plants and people that we've never seen before. Like, all of us would be like, I guess we had a huge blank spot in our knowledge. That's exactly what happened. The reason for the scientific revolution was the discovery of our own ignorance that Christopher Columbus gave us. So what happens as a result of that? Well, as a result, we have a flurry of scientific um, research that happens starting right then. Aristotle had done his work before, um, back in the years BC. So we went almost 2,000 years with like, yeah, we basically have everything. And now people are like, oh my God, I guess we don't. Let's figure stuff out. And what they did, the results, I'm going to give you kind of two general categories of results. The first result is that science leads to tools, which leads to us as superheroes. Now, obviously, that's sort of stupid. But I want you to think about what we got out of the scientific revolution. Start with physics, the study of motion. We got super speed. I can effortlessly move 60 miles an hour. With a little bit more effort, I can move like 300 miles an hour by getting on a plane. That I'm a superhero when I do that. We got super, this is not really a cool name for a power, but like super hearing and talking. Right now I'm in the mountains of North Carolina, and maybe you are too, and you can hear me, but maybe, I mean, it's certainly possible that you could be in California right now. 
Um, you can hear me all the way across the country. That's incredible. Nobody could do that. So physics, by basically creating the information um, technology required to translate the waves, the compression waves of sound from my voice into a digital format and and move them across this distance has given you and me this superpower. That's incredible. Again, we are like superheroes compared to the people who were living in 1492. That's just with regard to physics. Um, when you move on to chemistry, we have got chemistry has given us the power to create new materials, like the alchemists were trying to do. So we can create material like bulletproof vests. We can create even more mundane materials, like fertilizers or herbicides that allow us to grow food in ways that, like, to people living in 1492 would think that we were gods. We have magical powers that allow these plants to grow the way they do. That's incredible as well. Um, and again, that's the result of the scientific revolution. Biologically, from biology, we have treatments for diseases, medicines, that allow us to cure ourselves in ways that people used to pray to happen before. Um, we also, and nowadays, and obviously a lot of these, what I've talked about so far, are kind of things that you would just generally categorize as good. Um, now we have the ability to basically create or modify species of plants and animals. I mean, this is moving out of the realm, and I don't mean this to be blasphemous or heretical. I'm not talking about us as gods in the sense of, like, being divine. But, I mean, when you think about creating life, I mean, that's kind of the direction that we're going in. Um, all of this is amazing, and all of this, again, comes from the scientific, scientific revolution. We discovered we were ignorant, we started doing science, and we enhanced our ability to have an influence in the world in ways that no other animal has ever had. Again, uh, I'm, I've now moved us into the modern world, and it's important for us to understand we're still talking about an animal. This is an animal that is still a part of an ecosystem that still has a carrying capacity that kill, still can overshoot. But look at the powers that this thing has. It's incredible. All right, so that's the first set of results. Science created tools which turned us into superheroes. Now, let's look at the second result that I want to talk about that is sort of a consequence of the first one. The second result is that everyone and every place are now connected. We talked about the fact that I can talk to you if you're in Canada, you could be in Japan, you could be wherever, and I can talk to you right now. We also know about the fact that, I mean, uh, that um, our capacity for violence also doesn't know any boundaries of space anymore. People in America can kill people in other countries um, without having to go anywhere near them. We have literally connected for better and for worse every person and every place on the planet. Um, that's going to have some consequences and that's where we need to go right now and we're going to do it in this video so we're going to do it quick. All right, so consequences. I want to talk to you about three, two consequences, two consequences. First of all, so again, we're talking about those results, us becoming superheroes, us connecting every place and person on Earth. Consequences. The first one is this. Um, oh, sorry, it is, oh, we have created problems. we didn't evolve to deal with.
we talked when we talked about us as a as a species. We talked about the fact that we are we evolved to be able to solve clear and present problems. The cheetah over there that I need to get away from, or the food that I have to get today. How am I going to kill that antelope so that I can eat it? Those are the problems that we that we um, evolved to deal with. But with the scientific revolution, with us bending the law of ecology and turning the entire planet into one ecosystem, what we've done is created problems that are not immediate and present, but that are long term and distant. The, uh, the kind of the quintessential example of this sort of long-term distant problem is the problem of, problem of climate change. Climate change is something that uh, all Earth scientists tell us is going to be a major problem for our species. I mean, we're talking about, um, about because we're changing the ecosystem, the planet that we live on, we are going to overshoot and there's going to be a collapse. How do we, that, this is not a problem that I solve today. I mean, yeah, I can take steps, but the problem is massive. It's decades long that we're talking about. I didn't evolve. My brain didn't evolve to be able to deal with that. So if it were a clear and present, like if I get in my car today, the Earth's uh, temperature is going to go up by 50 degrees, I'm not getting in my car. That's a clear, present problem. Right now, what I've got is, if I get in my car today, it is going to incrementally raise the temperature of the Earth over the course of the next decades. Yes, I'm capable of processing that information. I'm just not good at it. That's not the type of problem that I, that I evolved to deal with. In terms of distance, one of the big problems um, with regard to climate change is the fact that uh, the Amazon rainforest, mostly in Brazil, is being cut down. The Amazon rainforest is, uh, functions in a couple of ways. First of all, is it absorbs carbon. Um, well, I guess that's the main way that it, that it functions to help um, deal with climate change. The more trees there are, the more carbon gets absorbed, the, more, the less is in the, uh, in the atmosphere to trap, um, to, to heat up the planet. So what you end up with as long as, uh, to the extent that we're cutting those trees, you end up diminishing our capacity to trap that carbon. But here's the problem with this. I don't live in Brazil. I live in North Carolina. How, do, how am I going to deal with a problem that exists on a different continent? The reality is that's a problem that impacts me. So what we've done is we have created problems that we're not evolved to deal with. I'm not evolved to, how do I deal with a problem that is that long-term and that has sources that are that distant? Uh, ultimately, I have to try to figure out a way because again, this is the experiment we're in. Put me into a society that has those kinds of problems. I gotta figure it out. Um, I'm just not good at it. I didn't evolve to deal with it. All right, so that's consequence number one. Consequence number two that we need to deal with is, again, we have changed the nature, changed the nature of collapse. So the first, uh, a collapse in a general way is a reduction in, change the nature of collapse. Collapse, to begin with, is a reduction in the, uh, in the number of a species in a particular ecosystem. We got that. With the agricultural revolution, we change the nature of it. So it's not just a quantitative reduction. It can also be a qualitative reduction, reduction in the standard of living. But now we've changed the nature of collapse one more time. And now it is that, um, that collapse can be dependent on people far away. In other words, what can happen is that my collapse, like the, uh, the collapse of the American society, this population of people in the United States of America, could depend, as I said, on what's happening in Brazil. Our standard of living could dive because 
Brazil cuts down the entire Amazon rainforest. It could dive if China decides they're going to build more coal-powered um, power plants. In either case, though, collapse is now not just dependent on me. My life, my, um, my standard of living could fall apart, could be reduced in quality based on things that, uh, that are not even happening where I am. That, again, is a major change. The, the, uh, it's, it's a change in the way ecology works. Once we make the earth one big ecosystem, we change the nature of collapse again so that what happens in one place could impact things somewhere else. All right, the last thing I need to talk to you guys about is in conclusion. So in conclusion for this, we've talked about this is all, this has all been, sorry, this has all been about, um, about us as an animal species that lives in an ecosystem. And what we've gotten to is modern society where we've got all of these powers, but also um, these consequences that we're not evolved to deal with. Where we're going to go in the class now is into the idea that every animal species either achieves balance or overshoots based on its instincts. Every animal species except one, and that one is us. Um, we achieve balance or we, achieve, or we um, overshoot based on the way we set up a society. What we've seen is if you set up an agricultural society, it changes the rules of ecology. It bends them, at least to some extent. When you set up an industrial society after the scientific revolution, again, it changes the way we are in our ecosystem. So because we're not dependent on instinct, because what the way this whole thing works is based on society, now it's time for us to understand exactly what is a society. That's where we're going to go in the, uh, in the next section of the